love these hard topics that we bring to the table, especially the last couple of weeks when we're talking about resentments and and uh, and different things. But uh, you know, it gets real quiet. There wasn't a, a lot of applause there. And uh, can we bring the lights up in the thing a little bit? Um, but over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about step four. We're we're going about it a little differently than we did over the summer, um, where we were going specifically through the twelve and twelve and the NA text. Um, and, and um, you know, for whatever reason, we're going over it this way, which I, I don't really know why that is myself. I don't plan or strategize on what we're going to talk about. I just know we're talking about the third topic that it talks about in the AA Big Book um, when you're dealing with the fourth step. Lord, I thank you for another day of off ground and out of prison. Lord, I thank you for waking me up this morning. Lord, I thank you for another day of recovery. Lord, I thank you for an open mind and a softened heart. Lord, when I do have a softened heart, I can hear things when my heart is hard and I hear nothing. Lord, I ask that you penetrate through this message. That people will either, ch either change their ways. Lord, I pray that they change their ways. Change their perspective. Change their outlook. Change their behaviors. Lord, that you always take care of business. Lord, I thank you for the head of protection consistently for nine years in this ministry. Lord, I thank you for protecting me in spite of me. Lord, I thank you for your grace through the multiple mistakes that have been made. Lord, I ask that your presence in a way that as we talk about a very, very serious subject, that they may be your words, not mine. I ask that you remove me from the building. Lord, I ask that everybody under the sound of my voice, including myself, may be present, which I have learned is a gift. But the spirit of preoccupa preoccupation and, and confusion is no longer welcome here. Lord, I thank you in advance for what you're ready to do. In your name we pray, amen. amen. So I told you last week that we were going to talk about sex. And uh, that's just one of two topics, and I think they, they coincide with, with each other. And, um, you know, and, and the reason why we're talking about sex is because it's the third thing when, in the AA Big Book when you're dealing with the fourth step. The first two we talked about two weeks ago, the first one was resentment. Last week we talked about fears, and, and, and this evening, one of the, one of the two topics, the, which again coincides with the second one, being temptation, um, is what we're going to talk about. So step four reads, maybe searching in fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Now, for many years I thought my problem was drugs. We've learned in the big book that that is a symptom. I've got to get to the why behind the what. The, 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 the what being active addiction, the why is it that I feel so uncomfortable in my own skin, just like when I met, had the privilege of praying over that three-year-old, three-year-olds act out. But I was 35 and I was still acting out. In my, I wasn't just, in my recovery over the years, I just didn't act out in, a, in relapse. I acted out in anger and resentment and fear. And many times I also acted out in sex. And I misused that gift that God had given us. And I think if you look in and were to really know anybody's story when it comes to sex, if you've been an addict or an alcoholic, it's not a fun story to talk about. Because that lust factor, when it's not channeled in the right direction, is no different than using it. Because when lust is on you, your flesh is craving for something. And, and, and let me be very clear with you. I hear it all the time, and all the time I end up, it ends up in one manner. See, I hear it said out of people's mouths that this has nothing to do with me wanting to drink. I'll be very clear with you, yes it does. And I've heard it on many occasions said... That, that the last thing I'm thinking about is using. It's always about using. You're an addict and an alcoholic. At the end of the day, that's where it always ends up. So as the four step reads, I mean, for, for back in the day when I used to feel so uncomfortable that I had to act out. And, and when I was acting out, I, I thought it wasn't about me, but, but I never took into account, who is this affecting besides me? Is there family members? Is there recovery? I mean, how many people have I affected because of my unhealthy desires? 
See, it says make a, made a searching. That means I gotta dig deep on the why behind the why. I mean, fearless. I gotta become willing to look at things that I, I, I never, because I never understood quite why I was a chronic relapser. Why I had to go through a, a 11 treatments? Well, because I was never willing to take a searching and fearless moral inventory myself, as I've said on many occasions. That after step one, it does not talk about powerless. It talks about character and behavior and feelings. And it talks a whole lot about God. See, it's very important, as it says now in the big book, we, you know, this is right before it starts, in, at the end of talking about fears, it says, we never apologize to anyone for depending on our Creator. See, I was such a people pleaser. Now, as the person that God has selected to, to you know, be more or less be responsible for everything that goes on in this, in this program, a lot of times I had to apologize for having to impose certain rules on certain individuals. But I've learned now, we all know what we're supposed to be doing. But it, sometimes I realize that it hurt me more than it hurts them. See, it says, we, we never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality is the way of weakness. See, that's what I, I talk about often. You know, we're, we're, we grow up, you know, be strong, be strong. Don't show your weakness. Don't show your flaw. That's what got us here. But the Bible has a different solution for that. It says, when you are weak, then He is strong. See, when you admit your weakness, he can, you can be strong in Him. See, and it goes on to say, paradoxically, is a way of strength. The verdict of the age is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. So it, it, it takes courage to admit that you're weak. It goes against everything in your mind, because you were taught to be strong. But when I, when, if I'm honest with myself, when, the times that I thought I was strong, I was extremely weak. And I came into many different things, but it says they trust their God, and it's a trust factor. It says we never apologize for God. So, when, when, you know, the Bible, you know, God is a principal God. We have to, I mean, especially me as a pastor, I, 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 it's, a, it's not fun for me. But when, when I'm ordered by the, the man, the, being God, that I've got to, you know, run this in a way that he wants it run, it goes against everything in my brain, too. Because I'm designed to take the easier, softer way, like the big book says. So I, I'd rather run than confront. But I've learned this as of late. If you comfort when you should be confronting, you're just going to be comforting for many years. And the issues will never be addressed. And that's what the fourth step is all about, is dealing with the underlying issues. That's why many people don't do it. Or they, they just do it on a surface level. I remember being at Hazelden and one of the requirements is that I had to do a fourth and a fifth before I left. And I, and I did it because I was obedient and I was willing. But at that particular time, I, I didn't have enough clarity because it was only 28 days into me not using that I couldn't dig up much stuff. I mean, being thorough and fearless and searching takes a little bit of time. But a lot of time people use that as an excuse. And it months, years go by before people really do it. But it goes on to say, we ask Him to remove the fear and direct our attention to what He would have to be, us to be. At once we commence to outgrow fear. So what we learn about fear is, fear is a factor. Fear will always be there. Fear isn't always a bad thing. I'm afraid of my addiction. That's what gets me going to meetings. I'm afraid of me. <laughs> See, they taught me at his young age, you know, don't touch the stove. It'll burn you, so I was afraid to touch the stove. Fear is not always a bad thing. I, I heard one of my friends last week in small group say, you know, I was afraid if I didn't get back to Sunny Village, I was going to die. That's healthy fear. See, I mean, but, 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 but outgrow means it's a process. I mean, the, the big book says it's progress rather than perfection. As long as we're progressing. See, I've heard it said many years in the program that, well, I'm kind of stagnant in my recovery. No, you're not. You're either going towards the bar or towards God. There is no sense of standing still in your recovery. See, it's so important. That, see, the one thing I've learned about Serenity Village is you're going to hear it in the raw. There's, there's no sugarcoating here. And once you hear it in the raw, the way it's designed to be heard, if you go back, it ain't going to be anything pretty. 
And, and I'm a testimony of that. I went back plenty of times. See, and, and, and the key is, it's not how many times you fall, it's how many times you get back up. I mean, your last relapse could be the best thing that's ever happened to you. See, it's so important that, that we grasp it, but now it says, now about sex. We all have sex problems, it says. Do you have a sex problem? It says, we all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? We reviewed our own conduct over years past, where we have been selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. Well, I'll tell you what. Now you're seeing the mirror of using in sex. When you use your selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. See, sex is, is a God-given gift. But I mean, what I mean, a lot of times when you're acting out sexually, you're honest, you're inconsiderate, and you're selfish. See, I work with men all the time that want to go and date single women, single mothers. And I said, you better be careful, man, because your decisions aren't just affecting that woman. And, and even women in general. I mean, I'm not, I, mean I, I know you women aren't saints either. But even women in general, do you want to put somebody's recovery at risk because you want to act out sexually? And, and it's so important that we realize, I mean, a lot of times my addiction took me in, in places that, that, that I wasn't proud of. I mean, think about when you woke up and you didn't know where you were or who was next to you. That's scary. Let alone you didn't know who was next to you. You don't even know what happened the night before. See, these are issues that, that we need to talk about. But it goes on to say, we reviewed our conduct over the past years where we've been selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. Who have we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? This is the why behind the what. Where we are, where we are at fault, what should we have done instead? What got, what got this all down? We get this all down on paper. See, when you put it on paper like the big book saying, it loses its power. See, when it's in you, you can't look at it. But when it's on paper, you can look at it from a different perspective. When you confess it, it loses its power. But when it's in you, it has power. See, and there's so many things in my life that, that I've looked at that way. But I mean, it says, we subjected each relation to the test. Was it selfish? So let me ask you. Has your past sex life been successful? And if you don't do something about it, that's what your future sex life is going to look like. And don't they tell us about the, the addiction of the active drug or alcohol use? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if I'm being inconsiderate, selfish, dishonest about what I'm doing, what's the difference of me using? Because it's always about using eventually. I've seen, I've never seen one, one exception to that, where it didn't end up in a relapse. <clears throat> Not one exception, because if I'm acting out selfishly, dishonestly, and inconsiderate, see it says, we ask God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. Didn't we just talk about molding on Sunday? That he is the potter and we are the clay? We remember always that our sex powers were God-given, See, God gives you this, but we misuse them. See, I mean, instead of people saying, I love you, they should say, I lust you. There's a big difference. And certainly you ain't going to love anybody until you learn the love of God and learn to love yourself. It's just a big facade. And it's going to end up just like every other relationship has. In a relapse and in the gutter. A lot of, you know, I'm not going to get into that because a lot of people haven't experienced forgiveness. But, but there's also other effects of sex. Children are born. Which are a huge blessing. And, and I thank God for, for, for grandparents and, and, and that, 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 you know, let me tell you, and, and I speak candidly about my family's history. She, she barely raised her. Her mom did. Thank God for grandparents. Let's give them a hand. 
because of God's forgiveness and no condemnation, we're able to live free today. We might have did it, but we're not. The Bible says that you're a new creation. The old is gone. See, that's gone. But the one thing is, if we don't deal with this sex issue, see, it says they're God-given, therefore good, and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or low. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we've done harm, provided that we are not to bring... It's provided that we do not bring about still more harm. So, a lot of times people say, well, I, I, we can't, you know, why can't we talk to the men here? Why can't we talk to the women here? Do I want this program? Um, you know, Jessica's here tonight. She doesn't want to enter in a dating service. She's here to save her life. But do I want the reputation of Serenity Village to be a dating service? See, I mean, it's not just affecting you. It's affecting the image of this ministry. And you don't even know when, when two people that long for affection, two minuses don't make a plus. But we always want what we can't have. We, we want what we shouldn't have. And I'm not just talking about fraternizing within the program. Why do they say a strong suggestion is to wait a year? And sometimes wait five years. But, but it's so important that we grasp it. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem, it says. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about this specific matter. The right answer will come if we want. See, a lot of times you don't want to hear what people have to hear you say. Well, that my best thinking got me here. I better start listening to what people have to say. And, and honestly, do you or I have that good of a channel between God and me that I don't need somebody else's perspective on this that has gone before me? And, 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 and we can have statistics, you know, in, in flashing neon lights. This is what will happen to you if you go down this road, but we still do it anyway because we think we're unique. See, it's so important that, that, that how we handle this. And, and it goes on to say now, counsel with persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. I talked about this in the leadership meeting last night about discipline. You need somebody in your life that's going to correct and discipline you. Because if you don't have that person, they will do it long before God does. And if you've got to wait for God to discipline you, it ain't going to be pretty. We've all been there. God puts people in your life to correct and discipline you because if it gets to the point where He has to do it, see, there's nothing more that, that bothers me than deception. The Bible talks about one denied and the other one betrayed. And we all know what happened to the one that betrayed. See, when, when it comes to sex, it's so important. Counsel with persons that often desirable. We realize that some people are fanatical about sex and others are loose. Go sleep with anybody. That comes down to low self-worth. I've seen a lot of queens sleep with people that weren't kings. Suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we are going to get drunk? Some people tell us so. So again, what it's saying there, and I'll, I'll read the next step, but this is only half true. So that increases your odds of relapse right there. This, this sex thing. It depends on us and our motives. Again, if you're not checking with somebody else on your motives, you're in trouble. If we are sorry for what we have done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we will, we will believe forgiven and we will have learned our lesson. It took me 35 years to learn that lesson. A lot of pain down the way. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing. These are facts of our experience. That's why it's, I can't be 
any clearer than I have been about men and women hooking up here. I've had, I've never seen it work. There's one, one that's kind of working. <laughs> but I don't want things to kind of work. And the person that's trying to look at that as an example will hold on to it. But I would take it a step further beyond this program. Why are you feeling so lowly about yourself to put yourself in that situation with somebody else? See, while you are being deceived, you might miss your husband or wife. Sex has a lot of consequences. See, it says, you know, it's so important to realize it. And it also, um, I, mean, I mean, if you go to any solid AA meeting in this town, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying all of them because there's a lot of solid, but I've been to like Tradition Five, and those sponsors are very clear where those women sit. Fox Hall, a lot of longevity there. They put me in check for talking in the hallway, and I, I thanked them for it. They said, are you here for a meeting or a social hour? <laughs> I'll never forget when that guy said that to me. I was ready to smack him upside the mouth. <laughs> but it's exactly what I needed to hear. It's exactly what I... See, when people start going down the road of deception and being dishonest and inconsiderate, you can tell. You can't tell exactly what's going on with them, but you can tell there's been a change because they start blaming other people to hide their own game. It goes on to say now, to sum up sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in a, in a questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves harder into helping others. So you got a you got a desire to go bust a move? Go help somebody. It goes on to say, you know, it hard, you know, we work harder in helping others. We think that if their needs, think of their needs and work for them, this takes us out of ourselves. It quiets an imperious urge. I mean, we all have those urges. Where to yield would need more heartache. Who else is affected by the decisions you make when it comes to your sex life? See, if people are making decisions about their sex life and you hear, it affects me. It affects the image of this ministry. It affects people coming that are yet to come. If people in the community of recovery that trust this program come to find we're a dating service, they ain't going to send anybody here. You just affected somebody's chance to get recovered. It's not just a choice that affects you. See, I used to be very loose sexually. A lot of people were affected. A lot of people were affected. See, and we've got to look at our conduct, and it goes on to say, you know, it's so important that we grasp it. it, it you know, we've got to get outside of because I don't want to cause more heartache for people. And one thing is, you never think it's going to cause, it just, why are you in my business? It's just, it's just affecting me. It's my world. I live in it. Well, your world got you here. See, the big book is so clear that this is a very, I mean, Terry, correct, I mean, this is a one out of three that they talk about with the fourth. This is a big topic that none of us really pay attention to. The sex thing is huge. Now, now it goes on. If we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. Your four steps shouldn't be a one-page document. I don't care if you're 22. A lot has gone down in 22 years. It goes on to say now we have listed and analyzed our resentments. We have began to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance. See again, learning tolerance. 
I, it often boggled my mind that everybody had to be to tolerant of me, but I wasn't tolerant of anybody else. It's like I wanted everybody to forgive me right away for everything I've done, but I'm going to hold resentment on you. So we began to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill towards all men, even our enemies. Wow. God is good. For we look at them as sick people. It says, pray for them. If your enemy is hungry, give them something to eat. By this you'll put burning coals, the Bible says. It says, we have listed, we have, we have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. See, a lot of stuff that I've done can't be undone. See, when you work a ninth step, there's no guarantee there's going to be forgiveness. The only thing that matters is that you forgive in. See, and, and, and that's one thing that I'm very conscious of today is i, I got to watch what I do because there's some things that can't be undone. It says, in this book you will read again and again that faith did for us that we could not do for ourselves. We hope that you are convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from Him. So isn't that something? <clears throat> that all these things we bring into our lives because of our selfish manners and inconsiderate, dishonest means that we have as human beings. <clears throat> that, 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 that we need God's help now to remove these. So why would God help us remove this? Because He loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. And he knows that if you have this, that won't happen. See, we've got to remove the blockage. And what it's saying here, if you have already made a decision in an inventory of growth or handicaps, that means this is going to get ugly. Handicap means it's holding you back. See, it's saying you have made a good beginning. That, that being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks about truth about yourself. Let me tell you something. Your life will always be a mess if you don't know who you are. But if you do a thorough four step and get to know who you really are and move past it and change that person by the help of God, your life, your mess, will turn into a message. But if you don't do a four step, you're always going to have a mess. That's why God wants to remove the blockage. And, 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 and my second topic tonight is temptation. But real briefly, I want to hit on the fact of step five. So we, 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 we took a look at our resentments. We took a look at our fears. Now we looked at sex. And in the fact, I, I want to tell you, I want to reiterate to you, because I've been down the road myself. When I act out sexually, I'm, I'm, I'm feeding a, a temptation that meets my desire, and it's the same flesh muscle that, is, that I do when I use. So I'm strengthening that muscle, because eventually sex ain't going to cut it. Just like alcohol didn't cut it, and marijuana didn't cut it, I continue to want more things that would get me out of me. See, the devil will always take you farther than you want to go. See, what I learned when Nikki was in treatment from her counselor, he said that, you know, wouldn't that be something when we made choices we could pick the consequence of that choice? See, the key is now, as we're talking about step five, admitting to God ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Our wrongs, not your wrongs, our wrongs, my wrongs. James 5.16 says, you know, and let me tell you something. If you don't do a four and a five, six through twelve ain't going to work. Because what are you asking God to remove? See, it says here in James 5, 16, confess to one another, therefore your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses. I loved it when Tyler came to me um, three days ago. Jeff, what you said really offended me. We talked about it. But what would happen if we 
wouldn't have talked about it. He would have built a resentment. And then it would have turned into a fear. And then you would have never known how you would have acted out. And the same holds true for me, but it says, Confess to one another, therefore your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. And pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to the spiritual tone of mind and heart. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available. Confession power. How are you going to have God become entirely ready to have God remove your defects of character in step six and humbly ask Him to remove your shortcomings in step seven unless you've confessed? It says right here there's a criteria, confession and power. See, and I want to talk to you about temptation now. See, temptation is, in a way, it's so important to understand, and I see this all the time in, in recovery. It says in Ephesians 6, 13 through 16, see, it says, therefore put on the full armor of God. My pastor said this two Sundays ago. When you go to bed, you can't take it off. You want to be protected in your dreams. Boy, if, you could, if my dreams were a movie screen, you'd all run out of the church. It's nothing nice. See, it's nothing nice to know how, how this works, but it says now, therefore put on the full armor. <laughs> you know I like my props. It says put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, see, it's not if temptation comes. It's going to come. It's when, the Bible says, when when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then, the Bible says. How many times have I had temptation hit me, try to stand up against it in my own power, run around like a lunatic, trying to do everything I can to overcome it, just to cave in? That's not what the Bible's saying here, though. The Bible is saying that, that put on the full armor so when, not if, the evil day comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. If you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And, but the big book says half measures avail is nothing. So if you only stand for half of the truth, you stand for nothing. It says you'll be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything you understand, stand for Now it says in addition, in, in, in verse 16, it says in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can distinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now here I am, walking around in my recovery, working no steps. See, I get tempted when I drive down 494 at the 10 hotels I used to smoke crack in. I get tempted when a certain commercial comes on. I, I get tempted when I go in certain neighborhoods. I get tempted when I... So, but here I am, sitting here with, 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 with fear attached to me, with resentment attached to me, with unhealthy sex conduct attached to me. And then when a temptation comes, oh man, I remember that 10 years ago. And all of a sudden, I'm, it's like a movie playing in my head. And then, and then it, it comes and it goes. And I think to myself, oh, I just overcame that temptation. The Bible says, fear, fiery ducks. Let me tell you something. Have you ever seen an elephant get hunted? The hunters shoot it with a tranquilizer. The elephant doesn't go down right away. They don't even follow the elephant. When the devil hits you, it doesn't mean you go down right away. It just means days or months later, if that dark is in... See, here's how I, I, I sponsor guys. Well, you know, I was thinking about using yesterday, but I got through it. I said, what did you do to get through it? Well, it just came and went. I said, no, it didn't. It's still in you. And, and, and I, I use the analogy of, uh, of an um, a ice block of ice that's getting chipped away. And pretty soon, when you've got all these temptations that you think you deal with that are still in you, 
Pretty soon there's so many in you that you cave, you don't stand. Pretty soon there's nothing left with that ice block. But, but it's so important to understand the fact is if you don't work the steps, you're, you're walking around in your recovery with fear and resentment and unbelief and you're fair game for the devil. And when you think you got it, you just missed it. You know, let me talk about temptation in another factor. If I got lust issues, stand up. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I'm talking to the men and the women here. Walk by me. <laughs> Pretty soon it's going to be this and this and this. And I'm not going to go into the next thing. <laughs> We didn't get here because we were disciplined people. We learned discipline here. The next time you say what's the worst that can happen, I'll tell you what will happen. See, it's so important to know that, that if, if I'm driving down 494 and, and then I'm, I look at the embassy suites over there and all of a sudden temptation hits me, it just hits me hard. Boom, I got another one.
temptation. When desire and temptation meet, it gets ugly. See, the big one says, I'll remove that desire. See, it's so important that we understand what we're dealing with here. The, the scripture card you have says, submit yourselves then to God. I say this probably six times a day as I'm driving around the Twin Cities. I've smoked crack in a lot of places. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart. So what, how, do I, how do I do this? All right, Jeff, Jeff is uh, over in St. Paul where my dad picked me up with a private. He had private eyes looking for me because nobody could find me. It's not supposed to be a father-son relationship. It's not supposed to be like that. He went to a hotel, right? I think they demolished it out of the lake and went to a hotel looking for me and, 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 and with tears in his eyes, this is where my son's living? The only thing they sold at the front desk was lighters. My dad's here tonight. See, you got to understand that when these dark see, you see, I love this scripture. That's why I gave you a card. When the temptation comes and, 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 and it hits you, it hits you in a way that you're, you're down. Sometimes the devil misses. <laughs> but, but, but when temptation comes, you want to act out sexually, you want to be dishonest, you want to hold on to anger, you want to be resentful, you want to be paralyzed by fear, you want to be anxious about everything. And if you put scripture on it and you say, no, no anger, I submit then to God. I'm not going to bed angry. I'm not giving the devil a foothold, the Bible says. And the power of God's word, submit then to God. That you can't think of two things at once. Let's try it quick. Ready? One, two, three. Try it. A couple of you think were successful. I can see your eyes up like this. But it says submit. So when the temptation comes, I instantly submit that thought to God. And then it says resist the devil. So I walk through my every day with the scripture. And then it says, okay, submit, resist, then come near to God. And God promises he in turn will come near to us. It says, it says wash your hands. You say, what am I thinking about doing? Sinning. Don't tell me you're not. Purify, let me just make sure I got this right here. It says, purify your hearts. All of a sudden, my heart is hardened because I'm about ready to go do something really foolish that jeopardizes everything I just worked for. You know what? The most thing that you can work for is a credible name. Because if you don't have a credible name, you have nothing. See, it says, purify your hearts, you double minded. Should I use? Should I not use? As I'm walking around the Twin Cities with darts everywhere. Every, I mean, and I don't even know they're here. People around you know it. They know you're, you're in trouble. But depending on how many darts you got in you, if they try to address where you're at, you are going to push them away. But we'll still be here to answer the phone when you get back. If you make it back. See, it says now in Matthew, now this really tripped me out. It really tripped me out if you read this right here. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God led Jesus to be tempted. God does that so you know who you are in Him. See, the, the, the Holy Spirit, it says in Matthew, that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. See, I mean, you know, you think you're all that in a bag of chips, but what if God leads you into a situation to see where you're, to show you where you're really at? You think you're, you are who you say you are? Let me lead you into a situation and see how you handle it. Do you think you are who you appear to be and put on a facade that you have integrity? And let, let God lead you into a situation to be tempted and see how you do. God does that, number one, to show the devil who you are. And secondly, to show you who you are. See, this is some deep stuff. And it says now, the devil, you know, what did he tempt Jesus with? 
He turned him over three things, many things, three. And the last one in verse 8 says, And the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And I will give, see how many times through lust and anger. And here, this looks so good, Jesus. It's yours if you want it. How did Jesus conquer temptation? It is written. Jesus himself activated the word of God. See, and it says, then the devil left him and his angels came in the tent. See, God might put you in situations to see where you're really at. Because you might think you're a little stronger than you really are. Let's see how you act now. I'm all in, I'm for real, I'll never lie to you, I'll never be dishonest, but in the right situation, you'll be all those things. And the Lord will lead you in there to show other people where you're at. See, it says in 1 Corinthians now, it says no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful, he will not let you be tempted beyond what, how many times did I use the excuse, it was just too much for me. It's not what the Bible says. It says, but when you are tempted, you will always provide a way out. It says now in the A big book, pages 84 and 85, we seldom be interested in liquor. This is right around the ninth and tenth step. I think it's right after the promises. If tempted, we recoil from it like a hot flame. Don't think you're stronger than you are. We react sanely and normally, and we find that it has happened automatically. See, you want to have enough deposits in you, so when these arrows hit you, you immediately address them with the Word of God. Immediately address them with the Word of God. See, it says we recoil like a hot We see that our new attitude towards liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. God just takes care of it. It comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and... What a, what a blessing to live this life safe and protected. What a blessing that would be. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor we're afraid. That is how we react so long as we keep our spiritual condition. So these darts are not just with using drugs or alcohol. It's how long are you going to get hit with anger and jealousy and frustration and critical spirit and judging? See, if you've got enough arrows in you of jealousy, you're going to use. You got, you've been to bed angry too many nights in a row through resentment, you're going to use. The big book says it's the number one offender. Offender of what? Relapse. It says no, but here's the trick. Here's where the victory is. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. So the word of God clips it off. 494, clip it off. <laughs> Dishonesty, clip it off. Lust, clip it off. Complacency, clip it off. Resentment, clip it off. See, this is what happens with the six and seven step. You know, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna judge you, clip it off. See, we've got to understand that it's a, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. That God needs to do surgery immediately on you when that temptation comes. Cutting between the soul. Some of these arrows have been in you so long; they're in your soul. It clips it off, it clips it off, it clips it off. And if I can't see that, I grab my accountability partner. Get it off me! Yeah. 